Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to the Royal Society. A couple of housekeeping things that I have to do, and somebody's just reaching for their phone, so please could you turn your phones to silent. And the other thing I have to point out, and I've always wanted to do this, is the exits. <laughs> <laughs> um, makes me feel like an air hostess. So in case of an evacuation, um, please go to the nearest exit. Um, and if you can't, then let people know and we'll help you. Um, that's that out of the way. So the Rosalind Franklin Award is sponsored by the Department for Business and Innovation and Skills, and we're very grateful for this because they give um, an award of 30,000 for research for the winner, and they also give a medal to commemorate Rosalind Franklin, who was an amazing biophysical scientist. So I'm delighted this year to be introducing this year's winner, Lucy Carpenter. I chair the panel, and we always have a very difficult time choosing somebody because not only do they have to be a great scientist, but they have to really fulfill something else, which is some public engagement of science. And there was a really clear winner in Lucy. She was already doing all of the things that we were looking for her to do. So this was, uh, made my job very easy because she really stood out as someone who's passionate about engaging with the public. Not only as a woman, she engages families, which I thought was a great uh, thing to be doing. So I'm delighted to introduce Lucy. The title of the talk is what on earth is happening to our atmosphere? Great title. I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Carol, for a very generous uh, introduction. And thank you to all for, for coming tonight, um, especially to many colleagues and friends that are here tonight. It's really nice to see people that I've known probably for more years than I'd like to, like to consider, and some going back to my PhD years and some newer colleagues as well. And, and it's really thanks to collaborations with many of you, as well as the hard work um, by my research group over the last you know, many years that I'm I, you know, here tonight to accept this award, uh, the Rosalind Franklin Award. Um, just speaking of colleagues, I would like to just say that I'd like to dedicate this talk to, to Roland von Glas Glasow, a, a colleague at UEA um, who, of many of us, very valued and wonderful colleague who died recently of cancer. So I'd just like to, to uh, remember him tonight. Okay, so doing a little bit of research on Rosalind Franklin um, before this. So, so I, I, obviously we all know that she's very well known for her work on viruses and on DNA. And I was very pleased to see as well, she actually started um, her research career as a physical scientist, uh, actually working for Norrish, who much later went on to win a Nobel Prize for his work in fast photochemical reactions. Atmospheric chemistry really relies, very, draws very heavily on, on physical chemistry um, in understanding the fundamentals. So I feel that as an atmospheric chemist, we, we share the same Venn diagram of, of, as Franklin. So I was quite thrilled to, to know that. Um, but my talk today is about um, atmospheric science. Um, it's going to ho hopefully show you, share with you some of the work my research group has done in this field and also talk about some of the major issues that have affected uh, um, the, the atmosphere over the last m sort of few decades um, and what, what we understand today. Okay, to sort of to start with um, looking at the challenge you have if you're an atmospheric chemist, I thought we'd let's, let's all look at the composition of the atmosphere. And everybody knows that the atmosphere is made up of around 80% um, 80 nitrogen and 20% oxygen, more or less, although it's slightly less than that. So there's about 1% that's not made up of nitrogen and oxygen. And most of that actually is argon and water vapour. And it's not till you get very low down the list here, very, very low percentages, that you start to see gases that are interesting to the atmospheric chemist. So here's ozone down here at many fractions of a percent. Um, gases like methane are also very interesting. Um, and these gases are interesting because they are reactive. Many of them absorb light, many of them react, and that's why they are so low in the atmosphere. So our, so our challenges of these are to really capture these very low concentrations, um, and these are the ones that we call trace gases, and we often measure them in these sorts of units here, um, parts per million down to parts per trillion. And I just thought I'd try to illustrate what we mean by these kind of units um, 
talking about what are trace concentrations. So if we imagine this box here is a cube taken from the atmosphere at any one point, and we take 1,000, this is a 10 by 10 by 10 grid um, cube here. So every one tiny um, box in there is 1,000th of that volume. So if we take one of those tiny boxes, that's a part per thousand in the atmosphere. And here we're talking about the sorts of concentrations that you might find water vapour in the atmosphere. Um, we then take one tiny box of that, um, and then we have one thousandth of a one thousandth, so we're now into the parts per million range. And a ppm is the sorts of concentrations you might find, ozone at its maximum levels in the stratosphere. Um, CO2 at the moment is around about 400 ppm, so these are kinds of the concentrations we find, some of these sort of higher gases. If you then take one of those boxes, you're then a thousandth of a thousandth of a thousandth, so you're then a part per billion by volume. And these are the sorts of concentrations you might see ozone at the surface, um, maybe sort of 20 to 100 ppb, and many other trace gases as well. And the region that my group have been looking at, and many others as well, is really at the parts per trillion level. So this is one part now in 10 to the 12 others of the atmosphere. And it's, th it's this part that you'll find the very reactive radicals in the atmosphere. And what we've been looking at particularly are reactive halogens, I mean, they may be present actually at sub-PPT levels, so right down to a 20th of a PPT. So clearly we need to have a very sensitive way of detecting these molecules. And one technique, um, which is a very widely used technique my group have been using, is that of gas chromatography mass spectrometry, or GCMS. Um, essentially, GCMS and, and, and mass spectrometry has been uh, is, is used in many, many fields. Um, Carol here has based her, her, her career on, on looking at mass spectrometry for different reasons. And what we do here for gas chromatography, we first of all separate a complex sample, and the atmosphere can contain many millions of components, so it clearly is a very complex sample. It's very hard to drill down into that complexity. Um, so the column, we have a GC column, which is essentially a tube, um, coated with some um, um, coating here which interacts with these gases. So here we have this complex sample which is then separated into its component parts along the column. And out of the GC then you'll get these kind of peaks coming out here where each peak corresponds to a group of the same sorts of molecules. So that's great, you've now separated those gases. However, to analyse them by the mass spectrometer you first of all need to ionise them so they have a charge um, and that's done in, in this component here. And once they have a charge, you can then separate them by a magnetic field or by an oscillating electri uh, electric field, which then separates these ions according to their mass or, or their mass to charge ratio. And this means that for each one of these peaks here, we have a huge amount of information um, on, on their masses, on their fragment masses. And this really allows us to both um, get down to very, very sensitive levels, but also come up with a very uh, unprecedented amount of information um, as to the nature of these gases. Um, GCMS was first used in the 1950s, um, and so, you know, as an experimentalist, I'm very grateful for people who, who discovered this technique and um, also thankful that things have got a little bit smaller and more portable since then. Um, this was obviously before computer control as well, um, and out of here you can see the, um, the data coming out on chart paper, which seems a little bit Luddite, but I actually remember the beginning of my PhD um, we used to actually have chart paper, almost as though we didn't quite believe the results the computer was telling us. So we had to have chart paper as well. So that was only 20 years ago, so things have moved very, very rapidly. Um, so this was in the US, and I think the first measurements by GCMS were of fatty acids in the liquid phase. Um, um, which were, and, and now we have instruments that routinely look something like this. They sit on a bench, um, they're controlled by laptop computers. Um, but we, in order to actually to put these into the field and to measure atmospheric components, uh, we often measure components in seawater as well, we need to add more functionality to those instruments before they're ready to use. First of all, we have to find ways, and ignore this diagram, it's one that um, my postdoc who loves to do these kind of diagrams has come up with on, on CAD draw or something like this, um, to design the instrument. Um, we have to automate it so they take the sample automatically and also pre-concentrate that sample. So often we are trying to pre-concentrate and strip out the nitrogen and oxygen that we're not interested in and really drill down to the, some of the organic molecules that we are interested in. And we add functionality, um, that could be in terms of calibrating and, and so you know the response of the instrument. In this case, this is, a, this is an instrument that goes on a ship. Um, and this part here, we have a component for measuring, for stripping out the gases in seawater and being able to measure those automatically. So every half an hour or so, we have 
a trace. And so therefore, you, hopefully they're in a situation where you can put one of these things on a ship or an aircraft and send it around the world and get lots and lots and lots of data. Um, and these instruments have been really the workhorses for detecting atmospheric composition for a number of years. This is a, um, some data from NOAA and shows long-term records over decades of some important gases like CFCs, um, carbon tetrachloride here, CCL4, that are very important in stratospheric ozone. Um, and GCMS here came on board around the early 1990s and, um, and is very, because of its accuracy, precision and sensitivity, it's been a real workhorse for these kind of measurements. Um, these are our own group's measurements of carbon tetrachloride CCL4, and this is actually made in seawater. And this doesn't look very much, but actually these are the results of five separate cruises taken over two years. So a, a lot of blood, sweat and tears went into these measurements. Um, and actually what we do on these seawater cruises is we measure the concentrations both in seawater and in air simultaneously. And that allows us to get a flux, or the actually amount of, of, of um, mass flux between one component air and another component seawater. In this case, we can see that carbon is going into the seawater, carbon tetrachloride. This means that the ocean is acting as a sink. In other words, it's balancing out the concentrations of carbon tetrachloride, reducing them, and actually um, reducing how much gets into the stratosphere. And this was known before, but our, our group are now looking at these measurements to try to understand the controls on this sink of carbon tetrachloride in seawater. So we've looked a little bit um, at um, how we go about detecting these molecules and the sorts of concentrations and, uh, that we're looking at. I just thought I'd look at really what, what some of the major issues are today, to sort of put this, put this in context. Um, and I've used this, this term Anthropocene. This was coined by Paul Crutzen, a Nobel Prize winner, to, um, to, to denote the epoch that we're now in where um, human activity is really the dominant influence on climate and environmental change. Um, so this has really gained popularity, this term. Um, so I don't know if anyone was around in 1950s in London. If you are, you may remember these sorts of scenes where clearly air pollution was a big issue, um, and also in cities like Los Angeles. And, and it really became a big issue because people were dying and getting ill in measurable and significant quantities. There was one period, five-day period in December in 1952 where it was believed 12,000 people died over a period of five days. And in London, most of the problem was due to um, coal-fired power stations, but also domestic burning as well of coal, adding to a lot of sulphur and all this um, photochemical smog. In Los Angeles, it was more, more to do perhaps with vehicle, um, vehicle combustion. And that led into the Clean Air Act in 1952, and later on, the introduction of the catalytic converter, which really was called the technology that changed everything. And it, and it really did it. To a large extent, um, it, was, it was seen that a lot of the air pollution, the really bad air pollution problems, um, were started to be mitigated to a certain extent. And there's a, more than a couple of people in the audience that know a lot about stratospheric ozone. I would say that, that probably gained public attention in the 1980s when it was observed that there was a start of a decline in stratospheric ozone. And that, of course, was linked to chlorine gases from things like CFCs um, and led to global treaties to ban or limit the production of these sorts of gases, which have been incredibly successful. And now we are at the point today where we're seeing um, a stabilization of stratospheric ozone and, and the, in fact, the first signs of a global recovery. Climate change, of course, around the 1990s, as it became um, obvious that there was a most, to most people at least, uh, an increase in global temperature, as well as the impacts on um, obviously Arctic sea ice and, and glaciers and other, and other issues. And I guess much like fashion, it seems that um, science has come round full circle because we're back now to air pollution again. Um, and it's interesting to think about why that is, but really this issue of air pollution is a huge one now for, um, for the globe. So if we take globally, air pollution is the major preventable cause of death, certainly by 2030, so it beats smoking and obesity, which is quite surprising when you think about the immediate attention there is, particularly on obesity and very little in comparison on air pollution. So globally, it's believed that air pollution kills around 7 million people a year and costs the global economy around about $15 billion per year. So it's a huge issue. 
In the UK, on average, it's believed to reduce your lifespan by around six to nine months. That clearly varies an awful lot from place to place according to where you live. And it's second um, only after smoking. So given that we've had these great clean air acts and you know, the, the, the invention and, and use of the catalytic converter, why are we in such a bad situation today? Or, or, or a situation that at least is, le is less good than we'd like it to be? Um, well, first of all, let's just have a look at what, you know, what these air pollutants actually do to us. So the main air pollutants are NO2, ozone, and this PM here, which is particulate matter. This is um, liquid or solid aerosol in the atmosphere. And these things um, affect your respiratory system, and there, from there have cardiovascular side effects. These include heart failure and, and stroke and um, coronary artery disease as well. So one of the reasons we are still in this fix that we are today, of course, and we all know this now from the VW scandal, is that things aren't quite what they seem. Um, and if you take the NO2 concentrations in London, this is data from David Carslaw, these are actual air quality measurements made in London, and compare those to the estimated NOx emissions that we thought were happening based on um, car test, you can see there's a big difference. And clearly there are many reasons for that. One of them, of course, we now know is that the, the, the car tests, the emission tests that vehicles have are not realistic and perhaps don't reflect the actual on-road emissions that they have. Another big reason is that there is a much increase in, um, in diesel cars in London. And diesel cars have a high proportion of NO2 emissions as a function of total NO and NO2, which is NOx. So there's that, is that things aren't quite what they seem. There's also the good news that the average life expectancy has changed. So if you are a man now, your life expectancy is, is 10 years greater than it would be if you'd born 50 years earlier. So that's quite a dramatic difference. And of course, then we are, we are more exposed to air pollution and it's, and it's more likely to be something that kills us as opposed to other conditions, medical conditions, where things have moved on rapidly. And, and finally, there's the issue of urbanisation, where many, many more people are living in urban areas as well. So all of those three things together, I, I suppose, create a bit of a perfect storm where air pollution has come back on the agenda. OK, so I've mentioned NO2, NO2 from diesel vehicles, and I want to turn next to ozone, O3. Now, ozone is called a secondary pollutant, which means it doesn't just come out of the back of cars or straight from a power plant, but it's formed in the atmosphere. So it's a little bit more hard to understand than those gases that come direct from a tailpipe. And this is actually, ozone was known to be uh, around in the atmosphere for a long, long time. This comes from a, a journal of Chem Society of Chemical Industry in 1930, which measured high concentrations of ozone around the Battersea power station. And they found that ozone variations in the amount of the ozone in the air were due to factors that we can only guess at and do not understand. I would love to put in that in a, in a publication today and see, <laughs> see what my reviewers' comments were. But, but at the time, um, you know, it wasn't really until the photochemical smog of Los Angeles that you know, we really fully got to, to, got to grips with this sort of chemistry. We now know that it's due to combinations in the atmosphere of, of this NOx, NO and NO2, along with VOCs, these are volatile organic carbons. And these can be a range of things, um, ranging from very simple light hydrocarbons like ethane and propane, um, which are emitted mainly from fossil fuel, venting and flaring, through to sorts of heavier hydrocarbons you might get from diesel. And, um, and globally, the, the highest source of VOCs is actually from biological sources. It's from, from trees um, and, and, other, uh, and grasses and, uh, producing isoprene. So in the presence of sunlight, they create ozone. And, I, and I've just found a little cartoon on the internet. I hope this doesn't make your eyes bleed. It's, it's, but it's, um, it's showing, a, in a way, that ozone is a classic version of a... Formation of ozone is a classic example of a catalytic cycle. If you remember your, your chemistry, so a catalyst is something that um, promotes the reaction, uh, the speed of a reaction, and yet is regenerated or does not change permanently. So remember the ingredients for ozone, we have hydrocarbons here coming in, we have NOx here coming in, or in the form of NO2 here, and some sunlight. Um, and what the VOCs do here is they create peroxy radicals. Here we have an RO2 peroxy radical, here we have an HO2. And this HO2 here, for example, is acting like a catalyst because it's coming around, being converted to OH, and then being kicked back to form HO2. And as it does that, it's catalyzing the conversion of NO to NO2. Once you have an NO2 molecule, that, this can be photolyzed to produce a magic um, atom here, the oxygen atom, and that reacts very quickly with O2 to form ozone. 
So through this, you've catalyzed the production of ozone. This, of, this chemistry can be very efficient in the right conditions when you have the right mix of ingredients and form um, very large quantities of ozone over a daily time scale. So you can start off with very little ozone um, at sunrise, and at the end of the day, you can have 100 parts per billion more and the World um, uh, Health Organization lim uh, safety limit is around about 75 ppb for eight hours exposure. And we can easily generate more than that in a, in a polluted day um, around a city. So knowing that we've increased NO2 emissions over the 21st century or NO2 concentrations through various use of vehicles and other um, uses, it's, you might think, well, ozone's probably increased as well, and that generally seems to be the case. So this is surface ozone trends um, uh, over, the over the 20th century. More recently, um, we're still in, in rural areas, ozone perhaps isn't changing so much. Um, in urban areas, ozone may still be increasing in the UK, although this is for, for fairly complex reasons. Um, so, you know, we really are see seeing a massive increase from these background levels to the levels that we are at today. Um, and clearly, so it's important to monitor the concentrations of these gases over time to really try to understand what's causing their trends and really, you know, are we getting to dangerous levels that we need to do something about? And we were lucky enough at York um, to get funding in, in 2006 for a, a long-term atmospheric observing station. And this was with colleagues at Leeds, particularly Mike Pilling, and also in Germany, Martin Hyman at Jena and others as well. And um, the idea of this station, which is really uh, in the middle of nowhere, if anyone knows Cape Verde, it's about 500 miles or so off the coast of northwest Africa. So it's measuring air that comes over uh, the North Atlantic and tropical ocean. So it's great. There's no local pollution sources, um, except for when electricity kicks out, we have a generator. But, but if you stand here and look out to the sea, the wind is coming towards you, generate about eight meters per second, very, very fast. So it's very, very clean. So it's a great way of measuring global trends and the background atmosphere. And it's actually, so here it is, here's Cape Verde, and all the red triangles here show you these so-called global observing stations that are part of a coordinated network, which is actually called Global Atmospheric Watch. And their job is to really look out for these um, changes in global changes in composition. Um, and some of these other, the CFC data I showed you earlier, some of those comes from some of these other stations there as well. Okay, so we measure many, many things at this station at Cape Verde. We're probably one of the most instrumented global atmospheric watch stations that there are. Uh, and some of the things we measure, some of the things we measure are hydrocarbons. We measure ethane, propane, and many other hydrocarbons as well. Um, this is actually uh, coming, comes from a paper a couple of years ago in Nature from Simpson showing how ethane, along with the methane growth rate, has changed since around 1980 or so. Um, and these are global, globally average. They have many, many different stations, and these are globally average concentrations. And you can see with ethane, it peaked in the 1970s, and it's pretty much, this paper report had shown a downward trend ever since. Um, and this was attributed to um, uh, lower fossil fuel emiss emissions, which are the main source, or from venting and flaring, which are the main source for ethane. What we see at Cape Verde, actually, is something completely different. So for ethane, when we first started measuring around 2007, um, so that you see these, these yearly cycles because ethane um, is, reacts with a radical that's formed photochemically, so you see lower concentrations in summer, and when that radical uh, goes to, almost disappears in winter, you see much higher concentrations. So you see these winter-summer cycles, so you can quite nicely see how many years we've been measuring. It's around about nine years now. Um, so to start with, there's, there's very little trend. The ups and downs show some variability, which you always expect in the atmosphere. But we now have um, a, a data that suggests we're really on a growth curve here, and the growth of ethane is around about 5% per year. So the question is, have this 40 years of declining ethane come to a halt, or even worse, has it, has it reversed? Um, do we now have um, an increasing level? To understand this, it's, it's useful to have a look at where the air comes from before it gets to Cape Verde. Cape Verde is here, and this is a so-called back trajectory, which shows you the pathway of air before it reaches the station. Um, and you can see, we, we see um, we're very sensitive to emissions in North America. Um, we also see some emissions from Africa and Europe as well. But what we suspect is that these emissions are perhaps due to um, US hydraulic fracturing. And we're seeing the first signs of a global influence of these gases. We also see a very marked trend in methane. This is data from um, MPI Jena 
and um, some predictions here that are roughly in line with those from um, this different, these different um, manufacturers. So, um, and if you, if, you look, if you hear the words of some of the um, uh, CEOs of these, uh, of these companies, they talk about really just scratching the surface um, in terms of shale gas. So it's really interesting to see what's going to happen. But we think this is the first sign this is really um, impacting us. And it will be interesting to look at whether this is being seen in other stations, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. OK, so a lot of my research has also been on the role of the ocean in atmospheric chemistry. And you can sort of see, in a way, um, so uh, American, North American pollution, if you like, um, uh, it affects Cape, not only Cape Verde, but also really across the other side of the Atlantic, the UK and Europe as well. So we see the effects of North American pollution, um, and they see the effects of Asian pollution. So this pollution comes around and circulated globally. And the ocean, in a way, acts as a buffer. I mean, first of all, if you take a gas like ozone, which is formed photochemically, um, it will be diluted as it comes, as it's transported across the ocean. Some of the ozone is deposited, actually, on the ocean surface, which reduces the, uh, the ozone concentration as well. But what we've been very interested in is whether they are chemical interactions um, that also reduce even further these concentrations. And... Um, when we first set up at Cape Verde, we, within a couple of years, what we noticed was looking at the daily change in ozone. So here you can see a maximum ozone, which happens early in the morning, and a minimum um, in around about the afternoon. This is, this is the almost the exact opposite is that you would find in a polluted environment. Here we're seeing day-to-day um, -day evidence of ozone being destroyed during the day. And we understood that this should happen because we know that ozone is actually photolyzed um, in the presence of water vapor, and that should destroy a certain proportion of ozone during the day. But when we run this through the models, we find that that can only really explain a small proportion of, of this observed daily change. Um, and so we have this additional ozone loss. And because we are measuring this uh, over many, many years, and, and at Cape Verde, we think we are representative of ocean processes because there's really nothing else uh, going on, that it should be representative of a widespread process. Um, this is data from John Plain's group, who is here, um, who was very, very kindly measuring uh, halogen oxide radicals. And these were our prime candidate for this extra destruction of ozone. Um, and John's group had set up a DOAS, which is an optical absorption spectrometer, which measures the absorption spectra um, of these various molecules and can get down to very sensitive levels. So if you remember the tutorial on PPT, these are one or, one or so parts per trillion of IO here, which is an iodine oxide radical, and it's similar for this radical here, which is called BRO. So we suspected these molecules were somehow involved in this ozone destruction. Um, and in fact, when you put this chemistry into the model, you can see that the, the, the observations are much better um, simulated now. So the question is, how does this chemistry occur? And this is kind of a simplified diagram, but the basis is that when you have iodine or bromine atoms in the atmosphere, they react with ozone to form these IO or BRO radicals. These were the radicals that were observed. And you have various chemistries that recycle back to iodine, and this keeps cycling round. As it does so, it destroys the ozone. And the same thing happens for bromine. And so what we've um, been looking at is whether or not we really fully understand the sources of these gases. Um, so do we really understand what's giving rise to these amounts of bromine and iodine? Now, for bromine, there are two major sources. One is from um, organic gases. These are so-called short-lived organic gases, and this is bromoform here. Um, and this shows actually a profile um, of bromoform right to the stratosphere. That's a different story that I'm not going to go on to today. Or interestingly, this gas can actually be transported to the stratosphere in um, certain regions, which contributes to stratospheric ozone depletion. But at the moment, we're more, we're more interested in this region down here, a tropospheric ozone. And we know that the concentrations of these gases um, are full within a certain range over the globe. So we've got a fair idea how much bromine comes from gases like this. And the other source in the troposphere is from sea spray. Um, sea spray, of course, is a natural phenomena. And obviously, sea spray aerosol has is, is got a lot of salt in there, a lot of sodium chloride, a lot of sodium bromide. And in, again, in the right conditions, there are reactions that take place on the surface of those aerosols, um, particularly when they are slightly acidified, 
which means that you release uh, reactive and gaseous bromine as well as this Br2, as well as BrCl. And there was very nice evidence of this happening um, from a station in, on, on, a, on Tasmania from um, a paper by Greg Ayres many years ago. And what he showed here, um, are these measurements at Cape Grim, so is that if you look at the um, bromine and aerosol, the enrichment factor, which is how much bromine is in the aerosol compared to how much is in, this, um, uh, is in the atmosphere, was always below one. And this shows that the bromine was released to the atmosphere. So, so again, we have a reasonable picture of how much bromine there was from these sorts of processes. So when it comes to iodine, well, um, the ubiquitous presence of iodine in the atmosphere was sh first shown by uh, James Lovelock in 1972. He measured methyl iodide, and actually he linked that to his theory, his Gaia theory. He took the presence of methyl iodide actually as being consistent with Gaia because the, um, the ocean was producing this methyl iodide which is iodine is a, is a central nutrient for human and animal health in a kind of altruistic way to provide iodine to land. Um, so James Lovelock f discovered methyl iodide, and for a long time this was thought to be the main source of iodine to the atmosphere. My research group spent many years um, showing that it wasn't just methyl iodide, but there were all these other organic gases as well. And um, there may be people here that have been on these cruises, and thanks to them we had a much better picture and found that these other more complex gases were just about as important as methyl iodide from the ocean. And so we thought we were very clever, we thought this would add up to the amount of um, iodine that we would need to explain these models, um, and that is not the case at all. So this is the IO that was observed uh, at Cape Verde, and this dotted line here is about the amount that you would expect from these gases here. So you can see it falls rather short, probably explains only around 20 to 25 percent. Um, and at this point, um, uh, we, along with other colleagues, kind of scratched our heads and decided, like many chemists do, it was time to get in the lab. Enough going around in the field. Let's figure out this problem by going back in the lab. Um, and we looked at some, actually, some research that had been done in the 1980s to say, well, it's not these organic gases at all. It's an interaction that you have with ozone with iodide. Iodide, like bromide and chloride, is a natural part of the ocean and it's enriched at the surface of the ocean. So here we have the ocean, and this is um, the react reactive layer at the surface of the ocean. And what ozone can do, it reacts extremely quickly with iodide. This has been known for a number of years. Um, and it produces, first of all, this, this um, molecule HOI, which is hypoiodous acid, and that is in very rapid equilibrium with I2. And what we were able to do is actually put, by, by various lab studies, is figure out the controls on this production and work out how much is going to get to the atmosphere. And importantly, um, where there had been some um, research on I2, no one had really looked at HOI, because HOI is actually quite soluble. You wouldn't really expect it to come out into the atmosphere. Um, but we found that it was produced in such high quantities that it, it overrides even I2 as a, as a source of iodine. Um, so the long story is, is, the short story is that these emissions, I2 and HOI, dominate. And if you include these um, concentrations in the model, lo and behold, you get to the sorts of IO concentrations that you, that you need. Um, and then these emissions now are being used in, in atmospheric models to um, really better understand global ozone chemistry at the surface and to understand how these halogen ozone interactions work. And since those measurements at Cape Verde, which were, oh, that's going back about five years now, um, there have been many other studies that show that this molecule IO is present um, not only at Cape Verde here, but also in oceans around the world. So the dots here are all the places where people have measured IO. These are the concentrations. So the warmer the colour, the higher the concentration. And um, this is consistent with our picture um, that this iodine oxide radical is ubiquitous and having an impact pretty much everywhere over the globe. And the background colour there are um, 3D model um, calculations. Um, and those model calculations really reflect that the fact that they're higher in the tropics reflect our understanding of where this surface iodide chemistry comes from. So does this actually matter globally? Does this iodine chemistry matter globally? Um, well, so with, uh, with Matt Evans, who's here, the colleague who's put this into a global model with his student, has found that, yes, that is actually the case. And if you look at the effect on surface ozone, 
And if you put iodine into the model, it, would, it decreases the surface ozone by around about 3.5 ppb globally, that's parts per billion, and around 15%. That's actually quite a large number these days where I suppose most of the discoveries have been done and often we, we're tweaking around the edges. But this is a, a new phenomenon that does seem to be making a large difference to surface ozone. And if you remember that um, air pollution is costing us $15 billion a year, this reduction, of course, it's been happening all the time, so it's nothing new. Um, you know, you can see this as a kind of service to the economy, which is really worth quite a lot of money as well. <laughs> um, also, ozone itself, um, in, in the, towards the surface, is a climate gas. It's a greenhouse gas, so this has a beneficial effect on, on, on climate. And there are indirect effects that we need to understand more fully on methane and aerosols. But the other side of the coin of iodine, as well, is an interesting one and that it's not only interacting with ozone, but it's also producing tiny new particles in the atmosphere. And these were some measurements made um, several years ago um, at a coastal site somewhere on the west coast of Ireland, um, where there are, if anyone's been to the west coast of Ireland, you'll probably smell the seaweeds before you get there, but it's very rich in, in terms of seaweeds. In fact, they've been used for industry in the past. And so what we've got here in blue is a tidal cycle. And very, very strangely, because I don't think this had ever been seen before, um, people found that the particle concentrations maximised during low tide. Um, it's not really what people set out to find when they got there, but that is what they found, was that the particle concentrations maximised at low tide, when low tide happened to coincide with sunlight. So something was going on. And this is quite a complicated plot, but essentially it shows the diameter of those particles um, and it shows them that they're growing with time. So they start off very, very small because they're formed from the gas phase and they start off just a few nanometers in diameter and they quickly grow to um, larger sizes. And as they grow, those larger sizes can be important for climate because they can uh, affect cloud formation. Um, so we have evidence that iodine can really affect not just ozone, but also these particles as well. Um, and we later found out that this was due to, probably we think due to chemistry that was happening on the surface of seaweed, very similar to this chemistry that's happening on the surface of the ocean. So again, it's ozone coming in and reacting, especially when seaweeds are exposed at low tide and forming these IO radicals here. Now, until recently, I think most people kind of thought that that was a fairly niche field, something that just happened around the coasts. You know, who cares? There's maybe a few more clouds then, then, but there's already a lot of clouds in Ireland, right? So a few more <laughs> might not matter. But um, now, very recently, so in 2013, um, this slide comes from the University of Manchester, from James Allen and Gordon McFiggins, where we're on a cruise in the Arctic. Um, and we were, it was a great, great cruise with lots of different sites where we were often going through sea ice. And for the first time outside of these coastal regions, they saw a very similar thing. So these growth in, in particles, and also a growth that was consistent with a signal, which was um, the uh, mass to charge 127. So here's the iodine signal here. So this 127 is the unique mass of iodine. So we appear to have seen iodine associated with these events as well. And so the big question is, is this now something that might just not happen in coastal regions, but also globally? And you know, is the ocean really providing these sort of um, source of not only Arctic ozone, but perhaps globally? OK, well, I just want to conclude my talk there. Um, first of all, by just highlighting the fact that these ocean processes are tightly linked to global atmospheric chemistry. It's important that we understand them, both so we can understand the natural atmosphere, because to understand things going forward, we really need to understand how the atmosphere was 100, 200 years ago. And we can go out to these very clean environments now and try and study that. But also, there are interactions between this chemistry and the pollution that we're putting into the atmosphere now. Some of those may be beneficial, some of those may not be beneficial, so we need to know those. Um, these observations are vitally important in the clean ocean environment. They help us to understand these global trends in atmospheric composition. And perhaps, you know, sometimes the first sign that something is going on that may be affecting our environment globally. Um, for the, this ex one example of iodine, in terms of it being beneficial, we see that this cycle is actually a negative feedback for ozone. This means that the more there is in the atmosphere, the more iodine actually comes out 
uh, of the ocean and destroys the, this, this ozone in the first place. So these feedback cycles are very important to identify. OK, well, I want to just thank you for, for listening. Um, and many collaborators and colleagues, which are too many to mention, um, here are some, a couple of examples of, of, of people in my research group. This is Steve Andrews and Sina um, Hackenberg working um, on that cruise in the Arctic. Um, it was a great privilege, actually, to be on field with, with your students. You see how hard they work. Sina was actually called the Terminator during this experiment because <laughs> she just kept going. Um, <laughs> and this is, um, this is our building where uh, we, we, we are. The atmospheric chemists exist in York, and these are just some of my colleagues here. I'd like to thank personally Matt Evans, Jackie Hamilton, Ali Lewis, Terry Dillon, and James Lee. And there are many, many others in that building as well. Of course, um, funders, um, that includes NCAS, the National Centre for Atmospheric Science, the NERC, the EU, the Wolfson Foundation, who funded this building, as you can see from the title, along with Tony Wilde. Um, and this is, our, this is our logo here, which we now have, courtesy of a graphic designer. I hope you like it. Um, and I just wanted to say something about, um, uh, Carol mentioned before, what I'm actually doing with the, uh, with the award money. Um, and Carol mentioned, so rather than th th do a project about uh, women in science, and I, and I guess I would say that I feel the department that I'm in is already pretty good for uh, women in science. It has a Athena Swan Gold Award, which we're very proud of. Not to say that more doesn't need to be done, but um, I'd been enthused, I suppose, over the last year or so from many things, from doing some exhibitions at a primary school. Um, and I'd like here to thank Ruth and Sarah in the audience, who have really done a lot here as well and been the people that have really supported a lot of the outreach projects at York. Here we are, this is actually my, um, my our local primary school. This is my daughter here trying on a aircraft outfit. Um, when people, the, the teacher asked at the end who wanted to do a science career, I think everybody put their hand up, apart from Josie here who, <laughs> <laughs> although she now wants to be an engineer, so I think that's great. Um, so what we thought we would do is have a summer school based in our building. We're very proud of this new building we've got. It's a great facility and have that um, two years running where we would have hands-on experience, um, mission-based tasks and really show, show um, the students this state-of-the-art equipment that we have and hopefully get them doing some monitoring, hopefully getting them making some simple scientific equipment, maybe with 3D printers or other ideas are around as well some demonstrations and a short careers talks and really to get their families involved at the end by, by seeing what their, what, their, what their children have done. And we hope to have a good level of female participation. Um, and also we have at York what's called the Salters Chemistry Camp. Um, and we have an opportunity through that camp, which happens every summer, to get involved as well and to bring people over to our building. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Where have we gone? Um, no, that was an amazing talk. Please stay, because I'm sure there will be many questions. Um, you've got just the right level, I think, for everybody to understand. If you would like to ask a question, please wait for a microphone and put your hand up. Um, seated here. Thank you, uh, my, my question is about... Uh, these very small concentrations of these uh, particles, chemicals, molecules that you've spoken about, and you were at great lengths at the beginning of your talk to uh, emphasize that parts in the trillion. How do these particles find one another to actually react? And what's the dynamics of that in terms of mixing? That's right. Which I don't think you uh, no. spoke about. You just said models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the key thing is, is that they are present. The, the atmosphere is a fairly dilute <laughs> mixture of these, cons of these different molecules, but many of them react very, very quickly. I mean, with a great driving force of the sun, which creates all these very highly reactive photochemical radicals, that that overcomes, I suppose, the fact that they, you, you have these dilute mixtures and that, well, you know, once they see each other, that of these things do often react. Um, so yeah, it's a dilute mixture, but off a very reactive one as well. So that, that drives a huge amount of you know, photochemistry and reactions and conversion of compounds from one form to another um, that you can see in the atmosphere every day. So you, know, you go out and measure things, they change in concentration often very rapidly. And you know, if you take um, 
some, some species you can, you can put into the atmosphere and they would be gone in a second because they are either absorbing sunlight, for example, being photolyzed very quickly, or reacting with radicals that are you know, extremely, extremely reactive. So that overcomes that fact that they is a dilute mixture. In the middle here. Hello, Stuart. Stuart was my PhD supervisor. I'm very pleased to see him here tonight. <laughs> use this. Uh, you focused on iodine, but you also mentioned bromine. And of course, there is a very well-known, or at least a, a very remarkable bromine influence as well, particularly in the Arctic, actually. Um, I've just come back from a meeting uh, in the University of Heidelberg, uh, honoring Uli Platt, actually. And he actually showed this thing called the bromine explosion. Um, now, that, that is also an inorganic thing as well, is it? Not an organic one. So that's the question. Uh, so, so the question is, is that an inorganic mechanism? The, bro the bromine phenomenon. Sure. I mean, um, I mean, that's a fantastic bit of science, I think, the whole bromine explosion and, and, and the term as well, that you can, um, you can explode, if you like, the bromine that's present either in sea salt aerosol or on the surface of snowpack by adding some gas phase chemistry and getting that bromine to, to liberate out and react in the atmosphere. So um, I would say that in polar regions, that whole, the whole reason why you have this bromine explosion is still slightly up for debate. We know there are a range of salty surfaces there. There's the snowpack itself and then you have the sea spray as well and you have snow that can be um, liberated and then that, that, and that has chemistry on it. So there's a whole range of sources. The exact... Um, nature of, of, of the dominance of those sources, I'm not sure we know 100%, but others may have other opinions. Thank you very much. Um, in the middle here again, please. <coughs> okay. Given that the most crucial issue facing mankind is climate change, why have you made no comment on the contribution of the rising concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which is the source of climate change? Um, because my research doesn't particularly address uh, changes in CO2 and methane. So my research really, and along with many others, is more about the chemistry um, so it's clearly a massive issue and the, the number one environmental issue. Um, I guess I was just trying to relate, you know, today, and why focus more on air pollution um, is because my own research has, has impacted more on that field. And as I say, ozone itself is a kind of little known climate gas. So it comes after methane. Um, so we often, you know, people that's perhaps not so, uh, not really brought out in the media, but um, ozone itself is a climate gas as well. I'm, I'm not, my, my research isn't CO2, I'm a chemist, CO2 doesn't actually have any chemistry in the atmosphere. So for me, it's, um, it's rather dull. <laughs> so that's the reason why. Yes, you showed, uh, you showed that there was a uh, correlation at the Cape Verde site between the ethane in the, in the summer and the rate of growth of, of, of methane. It, and it, do you think then that that growth I is attributable to essentially fracking in the United States, the, uh, the growth of methane? Because the methane has continued to grow and, is, and last year, for instance, is growing faster than ever. Mm -hmm. I think it's in the range of possibilities. I would say we haven't done enough research and uh, yet to, to, to say that for sure, one way or the other. But I think the fact that the rate of methane growth follows that rate of ethane um, quite well is one piece of evidence that would say yes. Um, so it's something we're, we're, we're looking at. Um, and obviously there are other reasons for growth in methane as well. Um, but the fact that those two are, you know, are correlated, I think, is, uh, is interesting. Questions? Oh, I'm sorry, but right up the back. Thank you very much. Lots of things are going on at the surface of the ocean in, in your talk. 
Um, is it literally the surface, or is there a surface layer, say a few meters deep, or uh, this is, is this going on as far as light penetrates down into the ocean, which might be, well, I don't know, 10 meters, 50 meters? Or yeah. is, that, is that an unfair question? That's a very, very good question, and one that I think ocean chemists like to argue about endlessly about what, how we define the surface layer of the ocean and what, what exactly is it. So there are all these terms that, that there are, one of which is a surface microlayer. Uh, I guess that's, you know, basically sort of almost operationally defines the surface of the ocean as if you try to measure it, that's about how much you can skim off the top of the ocean and then, and then do that. If you, if you try to measure the surface of the ocean, you will see it's very enriched in many components compared to the bulk ocean. So we know it's a special area for, for photochemistry and for all sorts of reactions. But that, that level at which you can consider it to be more reactive really does depend on the process. So it might be um, where, the, where the light penetrates to it at certain wavelengths. So, you know, if you're looking at UV light, that might be a, a metre or so. It might be where that organic layer is enriched. And in the case of the iodine chemistry, we see that layer as being the, the layer at which ozone can diffuse into the surface and react. So that's termed the reactodiffusive length, and it's around about a, a, a micron or so. So it really depends on what process that you're, you're looking at. But that's how you know, we're defining it um, here, because when, when the ozone is it's not very soluble, it's, it's only coming into the ocean because it's reacting with the iodide. Once it's gone, that chemistry has stopped. So it, it depends on the process. Um, one more at the back, and one more at the front, and then that's probably it. Thanks. Just, just a quick one. You showed a map earlier with red triangles that indicated where the global stations are. I think you said there were so-called global stations, and I wondered if you have access to one another's data. Good question. Yes, uh, and, and anyone can get hold of it. So um, as the part of the, the deal, if you like, in being a global station is that you, um, you put all of your data onto a data archive. So there are various of these things. There's one called... WDGCC, which is the World Data Centre for Greenhouse Gases. I'm glad I remembered that. But the UK have several data centres as well. And so, you know, as part of our um, agreement, I suppose, to, you know, to, to obtain public funding for research, it's our duty also to put that data onto databases where it is publicly available. So if anyone wants to see our ethane data, um, you can go on to um, one of these databases. There's one called British Atmospheric Data Centre, and you can request it. And uh, what often happens is the data remains with the scientists for a, for a year or two um, uh, before it goes public. That allows them to check, you know, check everything is OK, maybe have the time to do their own publications, uh, and then it goes open. So in terms of these global stations, uh, we are, there's, a, there's an annual meeting that's held in, in Boulder in the US where the global data is discussed and, um, you know, and it is shared with one another. So, um, yes, we can, we can go on and see all this other data as well. And the last question here in the front, please. Apropos of outreach to children and citizen science, can I say how marvellous I think your efforts have been in that direction? And can I ask you a sort of question for the future? Um, with uh, 3D printers and so on uh, coming on, do you foresee a time when, you know, serious measurements, uh, some sort of mass spectrometer or perhaps something cleverer than that based on solid state that kids can play with, is that coming? Well, we certainly do make parts with a 3D printer in our laboratory and we're probably not the only ones there. So for one, one example recently, we've made... Um, a membrane um, inlet, so it is, it, it's, a, it's a 3D printed version of something that can exchange water in air. And whereas it used to have to go off to the mechanical workshops and be, you know, hand tooled out of solid steel or whatever, we can now, we can now use that as a 3D printer. Um, whether or not you could ever use that for a mass spectrometer, I think our host <laughs> might have an <laughs> opinion on that. Um, I would say it's not without the realms of possibility. 
Okay, well, actually, if you were sitting in the front, you may have noticed that the clock stopped 10 minutes into, <laughs> into <laughs> Lucy's confusing. lecture. And I actually looked up and thought that was the real time when she stopped speaking. <laughs> so that's the sign of an excellent lecture. <laughs> and um, I think we should all thank Lucy again, and I'll present her with her prize. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.